what's up family welcome to every nation Bryanston and as usual Sevilla here and it is always great to be with you here on our online platform hey uh, today is actually our last in-person service 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for those who are actually going to be on our uh, actual property today at Knowledge Base. But also, uh, for those of you who are watching, I thought that would be uh, important for you to know because you're part of a bigger family, both in person and online, and it's so great to be on this journey together. Um, before we actually get into the word today, I want to welcome those of you who are guests visiting us either for the first or the second time here at Every Nation Bryanston. We are always so chuffed having new people with us. And what we do here, we love to give an 80 Rand donation to charity on your behalf just because you tuned in today. So if you wouldn't mind clicking onto our connection card appearing right now on the chat box or below this on YouTube, this will allow you to communicate with us so that we can connect with you during the week, but also it will give you an opportunity to choose one of three charities and we will donate out of our own pocket, not yours, but out of our own pocket to charity. So here is some awesome news. Over the last year, we've had the privilege of donating over 20,000 Rand to charity just because of first time guests who have either been watching online or visiting us in person. That means we've had over 250 people come and visit our Every Nation Bryanston home. So I want to thank you again for tuning in today and I really hope that today will be meaningful for you. We are on week two of our series, Words to Live By. And uh, last week, Pastor Carol shared a great word talking about Jesus' words. And today, I want to speak about <clears throat> something different, but something very important. Words to live by. Today, I want to speak about thank you. That, that there's something that happens when we give thanks to God. So, next week... We are going to be having a braai from 1 o'clock until 5 o'clock at uh, the school right next to our Knowledge Base venue. Please sign up if you want to be a part of that. And you can bring a friend, you can bring family. It's going to be a nice chill time. We're going to have food. And as I promised last time, this time the food won't come after, but it will come right at the beginning. So if you want to join us on the 13th of December, for our braai and hangout and last kind of in-person gathering, make sure you uh, sign up during the week to say you're gonna be coming so that we can prepare for you. Also, I wanna let you know that next week, we're gonna be here back again online with everybody else because next week, we're not gonna be meeting in person for services, but we're gonna be meeting online at 10 a.m. So looking forward to seeing you next week, 10 a.m. online and from one o'clock until five, on uh, uh, next week at our knowledge base venue for our hangout bry session hope you enjoy the word when mcdonald's first came out in the us of a a whole bunch of people started assuming as to why this startup was so successful uh, why they were booming so quickly and, 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 and everybody was assuming that it's either that McDonald's had superior burgers than other burger companies or that McDonald's had superior leadership. And, and it was their leadership that was creating all these multitude of franchises and why they were so successful. But when you looked closer into the, the bonnet of McDonald's, what you realize is that what made them successful was not their product, but rather their process. Their system is what made them successful. You see, ultimately, McDonald's was not selling burgers, they were selling convenience, and they completely outmatched anyone in their competition when it came to how fast they were able to give you a simple burger with fries. I think life is like that. I think when we look at successful people, happy people, uh, uh, great companies or even churches that we deem are doing a great job, we tend to assume certain things about their success 
that sometimes when we look close into the bonnet of their lives or the organizations or the churches, we realize that actually there is something else at work that is allowing them to be so successful, allowing them to advance not only in, in life, but in their own life mission. And today is going to be one of those days when we actually look in the bonnet of the most joyful people's lives. What we find is not that they have more than you and I. What we find is that by and large, they are more thankful in life than you and I. The, the more thankful you are, the more joyful you are. Science backs this up in so many different ways that thanksgiving, the ability to just say thank you on a regular basis impacts your, your cognitive thinking. It impacts your, your cognitive ability. It also impacts your emotions, that it brings something into your life on a neurological level, but also on an emotional level that nothing else can bring. But also thanksgiving impacts your physical body, that there's some of us who actually are, are, are going to have bodies that feel much healthier because we are thankful. It's interesting to me that when we talk about the early church, that this church in the book of Acts, and we try and figure out why they were the way that they were, we always look at the bonnet of the early church and we come up with a whole number of things, right? They had great doctrine. They had miracles. They had courage and boldness and great leadership. And we tend to forget that one of the reasons why the early church was so successful, why they endured so much pain, why they overcame so much adversity, was that the early church lived with a gospel-centered sense of thanksgiving. Whether they were in prison and while they were in prison being locked up for the sake of preaching the gospel, that they were able in the middle of the night, like the Bible says, to give praise, to give thanks to God, to, to reflect songs of thanksgiving to God because they were a people of thanksgiving. When you look in the hood of the early church, one of the reasons that they, that they outlasted their trials. One of the reasons why they continued in mission, even in the midst of death, suffering, and persecution, was the discipline of saying thank you, of thanksgiving. Psalm 107 verse 1 says this, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. I love what the psalmist is saying here, right? He, he, he not only gives you an instruction, give thanks, but he also gives you a reason. Give thanks. Why? Because he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Do you realize that the temptation in your life, the, the, the warfare in your life regarding the goodness of God and his steadfast love all happens in the battleground of thanksgiving. That, that you know you're winning when what comes out of your mouth is thank you, Lord. And you know you might be stuck, maybe even losing, when your mouth has been shut up from giving thanks. You see, when we, when we know he's good, when we know that his steadfast love, in, love endures, we give thanks. And sometimes we give thanks because we want to continue to fight for and believe that he is good, even in the midst of our trials. His steadfast love does endure, even in the midst of tough trials. And so we constantly are giving thanksgiving to protect that which we know and to affirm that which we believe. An old saying goes like this regarding thanksgiving. He who forgets the language of gratitude can never be on speaking terms with happiness. What we're going to talk about today is a sure key into joy, into the happiness of God, the happiness, the joy of the Lord. What is it? Well, 
It is simple words to live by, two simple words to live by. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Pray with me. Daddy, I thank you for your grace. I, I think of this year, Lord. Lord, a tough year for so many of us. Even as I preach this message today, only a few hours before this moment, two of my friends lost loved ones. And as I preach today, I, I feel the weight of a year where we saw your goodness, where we experienced pain, where we experienced your love, and yet we also saw a lot of loss. But I pray that as this message is preached on giving thanks, that Lord, we would be those kind of people with a gospel-centered thanksgiving that outlasts all kinds of adversities, that, that, that supersedes all kinds of successes in our life. So Lord, I do pray that you open our hearts, open our minds to your word today, and may we respond with thanksgiving. This I pray in your name. Amen. So today I want to speak about three ideas of thanksgiving. We give thanks for that which we see. We give thanks for that which we know. But we also give thanks as a sacrifice. Let's start with the first one. We give thanks for that which we see. In Luke chapter 17, there is an interesting story. It's about 10 lepers. Uh, and now to be a leper in Jesus' day kind of meant like you were borderline having COVID, right? You, 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 you had this disease or virus or whatever ailment that could lead to death, but also was very contagious. And you weren't allowed to be around other people and you had to self-isolate until such a time that the priest could be able to verify that now you were cleansed and you were ready now to be out with everybody else. Lepers then would, would, would be around themselves or, or with other lepers themselves longing for the opportunity to embrace their loved ones, to do everyday things that you and I take for granted, but they couldn't because they were confined because of the disease that they themselves could not cure themselves of. And so you've got these 10 lepers, the Bible tells us, who now find Jesus walking along the way. And they cry out to him. So we take the story from verse 11, Luke chapter 7. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. And lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, verse 17, When not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Or was no one found to return and give praise to God except the foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Ten lepers, seemingly by the story, there was one of them who was a Samaritan, who was a foreigner. And we kind of led to assume that the other nine were probably Galileans. They, they were familiar uh, with, with Jesus. They were familiar with the surroundings. And, and they were familiar with the idea of, of going to the priests. And Jesus points this out intentionally, right? The, the writer of this book, 
points it out intentionally that this was a Samaritan because we all know and if you've never read the Bible before and you don't know anything about Samaritans and Jews they did not like each other. In fact, Jews looked down upon Samaritans because Samaritans were people who were of mixed blood. They were Jewish and uh, people who were outside the Jewish culture who had come together. And so the, the Jewish people would treat Samaritans as if they were dogs according to the culture of that time. And so now Jesus points out the Samaritan eh, out of everyone else of the lepers. But you see what happened? The, all of them started off in the same social distancing space. All 10 needed healing. All 10 needed cleansing. But only the one who gave thanks moved closer to Jesus. We could just sit on that for a while and just talk about that. That there's something about come before the Lord in thanksgiving that actually changes our proximity from request to relationship. There's something about thanksgiving that moves us from focusing on our needs to realizing the, the giver of life, the giver of all things, the giver of all gifts. The one who gave thanks moved closer in proximity whilst the ones who requested got what they wanted rather, but their proximity did not change. So Jesus says to them, hey, all right, they, they cry out, have mercy on me. Jesus says, okay, go, go to the priests. And the priests are meant to check on them. And only the priests can give them verification that now they can go be with their families and, and they are cleansed, completely cleansed from leprosy. But as they going, what they failed, failed to see and to realize is that they got healed. How did they get healed? They got cleansed and healed because of the words that came from Jesus' mouth. But only one out of the ten realized, it says of the Samaritan, that he paused and he realized that he had been cleansed, that he had been healed, and he drew closer to Jesus, and he went and he gave thanks. Now, Jesus says something rather interesting to this one. Uh, he, he asked him, where are the other ten? It's a rhetorical question. He's trying to emphasize, why are you the only one giving thanks for being healed and cleansed, and why are the rest not giving thanks? thanks. And, and here's what you need to understand. You see, there was a difference here between the Galileans and the Samaritan man. The Galileans felt entitled to their healing, but the Samaritan didn't. He, he, he knew that he did not deserve and therefore gave thanks because he was a foreigner. He, he was assumed to be far from the grace of God. And now here God shows him his graciousness and this man responds with thanksgiving. One of the enemies of thanksgiving is entitlement. When you believe that you're entitled to the gifts that God gives you, you will forget to say thank you. You'll forget to say thank you. John Ortberg puts it like this. Gratitude is the ability to experience life as a gift. It opens us up to wonder, delight, and humility. It makes our hearts generous. It liberates us from the prison of self-preoccupation. This was this guy. He was liberated from self-preoccupation through giving thanks to Jesus. But then Jesus says this point, which is so powerful. He says to him, one last time, rise and go your way. But he says something to him that he never said to the other lepers. Your faith has made you well. The, the nine lepers got cleansed. But the word here, well, is the word to, to be made whole. You see that the nine lepers took steps to go to, to the priests so that they might be verified that they are cleansed. But the one Samaritan was made whole. Jesus spoke words that brought healing and cleansing. But when this Samaritan spoke his words of thanksgiving, the Bible says, Jesus said he had been made well because their faith 
The, the nine lepers, their faith made them cleanse. But this man's faith, through thanksgiving, made him whole. What am I saying today? You see, there are things that God has done in your life that you can see, that you can point to. You can say, there is the goodness of God. There is the steadfast love of God. I can see it. I've experienced it. I can account for it. I know that he did that. It is not enough just to acknowledge and revel in the beauty of what God has done. But if you realize that he didn't have to give you those things, that he, out of his graciousness chose to give you those things, be like the Samaritan. Don't, don't run after the results of what God has given you. Pause for a moment. Run towards the giver and give him thanks so that you're not just healed, but that you are made whole. You see, when we give thanks, there is an impact that begins to take place in our souls. As John Orberg says, it allows us to experience a freedom from ourselves. But when we withhold thanks and we feel entitled, then we, we are constantly trying to hoard everything for ourselves because we believe that, that we were the creators of our own happiness and success. Thanksgiving brings freedom to those who do it. Thanksgiving releases the soul from the bondage of pride. Has God showed up for you? Have you seen his goodness? Can you attest of his love? Then pause and give him thanks. Words to live by. Say, thank you, Lord. Second thing I want to talk about is not only do we see what God has done, but there are moments where we cannot see his goodness, practically, physically. There are moments where we, we, we feel like the, the present presence of God is far from us. We cannot see it. We cannot taste it. We cannot feel it. However, we can be thankful for what we know. See, we, all, we don't always get to see it. We don't always get to get that miracle. We don't always get to get that healing. We don't always get to get that thing we've been longing for. But we know in the midst of the waiting, in the midst of the trying to figure it out, we can still give thanks. Why? Because beyond what we can see, there, there are stuff that we know because we don't live by what we see. The Bible says we live by faith. We live by the things we know of God, the things we know and have experienced of God, and now we can look to those things and say, though I don't see a practical outworking of your grace, I thank you for what I know about you. Psalm 32 verse 1 to 5 says this, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So, the psalmist is saying something rather interesting here. What the psalmist is saying is that there are, there are a people who are blessed on the earth. The people who are blessed on the earth are not the ones who claim perfection. The people who are blessed on the earth are not the ones who have no need of forgiveness or have no need of God, but the people who are blessed upon the earth are the ones who know that they've been forgiven. The ones who know that, that when they miss their mark, that there is a God who forgives accurately and deeply. Those who, are, those who are convinced by and those who know the character of God 
Those are the people who are blessed. You see, there's two ways we can live, right, in light of our identity. It's either we might have a, a high view of our identity or a low view of our identity. People who have this super high view of their identity uh, basically live with this idea in mind. And by the way, I don't want you to, to hear me saying that we, we, we shouldn't be confident in who we are. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you live with a high view of your identity beyond who you actually are, you actually step into a place of pride. What does that look like? Whether you are religious or not, whether you are a person of faith or not, one of the reasons why we, we, we tend to walk through life with this high view of identity that is unhealthy is comparison. We, we compare our righteousness with somebody else's righteousness and we think we're better than them and we are higher than them because they seem to be failing in the areas where we are succeeding. And on the other side of the scale, it's the same problem. We look at other people who are succeeding where we are failing and we end up having this low view of self that we feel like we are, we are so undeserving of all of God's grace, that we we end up putting ourselves out because we don't feel like we can be in relationship with God because we are too far from God. Right now, as I'm speaking to you uh, on the house on the left of this building, there are uh, people busy uh, building two-story houses and they're standing on top of the roof. They are currently uh, a couple of meters higher than me. Now, if I had to do a calculation of between me and them, who's closer to the sun, they would be closer to the sun than me. Now, what tends to happen is that this is how we view life, right? Those who are busy on on the second floor, look those who are at, at, at the first floor and go, I'm higher than you, I'm better than you. Those who are on the first floor go, they're higher than me, I'm, I'm worse than them. But here's what I want you to see. According to the Bible, we are both extremely far from the sun. Extremely far. And, and we're busy with child's play by comparison. Because what the Bible ends up saying is that only God himself is able to come down and pick us up from the far distance of his grace and bring us into mercy. See, they might seemingly be higher than me, but they're still far from the sun. I might seemingly be lower than them, but I'm still far from the sun. We both need the exact same grace to get to the sun. That's what the gospel says. No matter how bad you think you are, no matter how good you think you are, you need Jesus. Jesu. I'm trying to find other languages to say his name in. Jesus. You need him. He is the only one who can pick you up from your prideful state and from your seemingly devastated state. So, We need God to bring us into that place of relationship. But in light of this text, here's the beautiful thing. Here's why we can be thankful. You see, the reason we can be thankful is this. We know. We know that God loves us. We know that God loves us because he's shown it to us by allowing his son to come down and stoop down and condescend and, and, and be made a human being. We know that God loves us. We, we, we know that God is good because when we look upon the cross, we see his goodness splattered upon, upon the cross, his blood flowing because that blood reminds us that God in his goodness allowed his son to be made a sacrifice for you and I. We know that God is capable and powerful. Why? Because he was resurrected from the dead. And if he stayed dead, he would be a powerless God. But the fact that he has risen from on high, he has risen and now dwells and reigns with his heavenly father dwelling as, as a king above all kings. Now we know he is capable. Therefore, we can give thanks. We can. 
because he's willing, he's loving, he's good, and he is capable. And that, my friends, we're able to give that kind of thanks even when we can't see things happening the way we want them to. We can give that kind of thanks because of what we know. So, the one who is blessed is not the one who is perfect, but the one who is perfect in their confidence that God loves them. The one who is blessed is not the one who has no need for God, is not the one who has no need for forgiveness, but the one who is, who is confident in the reality that God will forgive them and God will meet their needs. That man is blessed. That man is not haunted by his own, his or her own standard that they constantly are having to, to, to be good all the time in order to, to receive all that they want out of life. That person can now rest from the plight of trying to be good and can now receive all of the goodness that comes from what Jesus has done because they know and they live in that knowing. So are you not seeing certain things? You have a lot to be thankful for. Just look to the cross and you will know that God is faithful towards you. Lastly, sometimes we don't see and sometimes we struggle to know. What do you do when you are not seeing the practical outworking of whatever God has promised you? What do you do when in the midst of not seeing that, you're also struggling with the belief of what you know? What do you do? Well, you do the third thing. You give thanks as a sacrifice. You, you see, you don't give thanks as a pretense, but you give thanks as a sacrifice to God. You see, the problem with, with modern day preaching is that we have completely ejected the idea of suffering from our pulpits. We, we've created this idea that, that when we preach on Sundays or whenever it is that people uh, preach in their different congregations and churches, we've created this idea that we preach so that we might help people to be good people in a bad world. But, but instead, we ought to preach to help people understand that they are instruments of redemption in the hands of a fearful God in the midst of a broken world. We, 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 we've created this idea that we give goodies from the pulpit so that people might say, mm, amen, thank you, wonderful, great, amazing. We don't give goodies from the pulpit. We dispense the grace of God that you are ready. That, that when the dark night of the soul comes to you, that you are prepped with the deep, unshakable grace of God. Hear me. The dark night of the soul will visit every human being. The question is, when you suffer, will you suffer well? It is no question about whether or not you and I will suffer. The question is, will we be the kind of people that when we meet suffering, we would suffer well? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says this. Give thanks. Say thank you, right? In all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you please note what Paul is not saying here Paul is not saying give thanks for all circumstances no he's saying give thanks in all circumstances you see we people are continuously surprised by suffering because we haven't taught them how to be surprised by joy in the midst of suffering. And the only way 
at least one of the ways that you can find yourself being surprised by joy in the midst of your suffering is when you are able to count it all joy, all pure joy, when you face trials of many kinds, when you are able in your circumstances to find something you can give thanks for, when you are able in your circumstances to give a sacrifice of praise, that, that which you have, that last little bit of thanksgiving you've been holding on to for that, for that promotion, for, for that change, for that child to come. It's, it's when in those moments where, where confusion is too deep, when darkness is too great, when the pain is unbearable, that you are able to take that last bit of thanksgiving in you and still look at him and say, I don't understand it. I can't see it and I'm struggling to know it, but I thank you anyway. I thank you. I give you a sacrifice today of thanksgiving. Psalm 50 verse 23 says this, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. So, why? Why, why? why is it so important to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving in the midst of deep, troubling times when we cannot see and we are struggling to know? Well, here's your answer. Thanksgiving always invites peace. Thanksgiving invites peace. It, it invites it in, in two ways. When, when, when Thanksgiving invites peace, rather, uh, peace functions in two ways in our hearts. Here's the first one. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all knowledge, will do what? It will Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, when, when we are caught in the midst of darkness and we give thanks as a sacrifice, the peace of God that comes into our souls guards our hearts. It guards our hearts from, from the lies of the enemy because of the door of pain that has been opened. It guards our minds for, from, the, from, the, from the misconceptions of who God is because of what we have failed to see in the midst of our pain. But the second thing that peace does when it comes into your heart, invited by thanksgiving, is this, Colossians 3, chapter 15. And let the peace of God rule. Let it rule, let it reign in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and here's what he says, and be thankful. See, the peace of God is invited by thanksgiving, and when it comes into your soul, when it, when it comes into your heart, it guards your heart. But it rules. That word rule is literally speaking about an, an arbitrator, somebody who comes in and he settles settles issues on your behalf. That's what the peace of God does. It, come, it comes into your heart and it arbitrates for you. It, it, it engages the pain of your life, the, 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 the realities of the things that you thought would happen that didn't happen and the things that happened that you never saw coming and it arbitrates. It settles the issue so that your heart might find rest because now peace has ruled over it. Why? Because you have given a sacrifice of thanksgiving. In closing, what have I said? These two words are words to live by. And I believe as we even come to the end of such a crazy year, it, these two words are going to help us over the December holiday to process all that has happened. What are these two words? They're simple. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, thank you for my kids. Thank you for my friends, my spouse, my family. Thank you for the moments of pain that you've allowed me to see and overcome. Thank you, Lord, for the moments of success that are only possible because of your grace. Thank you. When we say thank you, we, we say thank you on multiple levels. And I just pointed out three today. We say thank you for that which we see. 
We say thank you for that which we know. And when we cannot see and we are struggling to know, we say thank you as a sacrifice to God. I want to close with this idea which points us back to the cross. You see, the day, on that blessed day, when Jesus hung on a tree, what was the darkest hour of mankind, we know in hindsight was the greatest hour of God's hand. You see, we don't, we don't always have to understand what's happening in order to be thankful. But the cross reminds us that God works all things for good, even the most darkest of things, like a God who has become man, rejected by mankind, sent to the cross for sins he did not commit, and was brutally killed and murdered. And in the midst of all of that injustice, in the midst of all of that depravity, the potter's hands were working so that salvation might come into the world, redemption might come into the world, that over 2,000 years later, you and I might be able to say, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Father, as we close today, I give you praise. I thank you for keeping us in the midst of such a crazy year. I thank you, Lord, for the spiritual family. I thank you for the fact that you are at work in all of our lives. Whether we see it, whether we feel it, whether we know it, you are working your plans for your ultimate purposes. And for that, we give you praise today and we surrender our hearts to you and say, have your way, Lord, because you are so 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 good we can trust you with the darkest most painful and also the most glorious parts of our lives we thank you lord amen hey what's up guys i really hope that message was meaningful to you and helpful for you i wanted to take a moment before we get into the blessing and worship to thank you the every nation Bryanston family uh, we've had the privilege of going through this year together. I, I wouldn't have asked for a better spiritual family to go through this year with. You are all uh, courageous people, generous people, loving people. The stories of people who um, sacrificed money to help their friends, who opened up their homes, who took care of people that they didn't even know by giving of food and income so that other people during this time can be fed and helped. Your generosity over COVID, that uh, for the period of March all the way through to November, uh, our giving was more uh, since we went through COVID than actually when we were meeting in person. That is a testament of your generosity. Beyond your giving, what I am more thankful for is your prayers, your presence, your faithfulness, not only to us as a corporate family, but to each other as individuals. I've heard so many stories of how people have been loved well through very painful seasons, losing children, losing parents, losing their jobs. And I wasn't there for those people, but you were. I wanna thank you for that. I am deeply excited about next year. And I know that together, we are gonna see God move so that we might see more people know God and make him known. So with that being said, I wanna bless you in this way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, now and forever. See you next week at the Bry and hang out. Much love. Focused on your promise But still I see the giants In the midst 
of chaos I will look through eyes of faith Even when the war's rich I know it's not my battle me must bow Cause you make mountains move You pull strongholds down None can stand against you Kings lay down their crowns Every fear is silence For your word is true When it seems there's no way You make mountains move Seems there's no way you make mountains move. 